Good evening. Hello and welcome to uh, our seventh Oregon Tech Together speaker series where you have the opportunity for an insider's look at a special aspect of Oregon's Polytechnic University. I'm really looking forward to this evening's conversation between alumna Chris Frazier and the current presidents of the Associated Students of Oregon Institute of Technology. I love to hear directly from students, and so I'm really looking forward to hearing from Mason Wishman from the Klamath Falls campus and Peter Wantuck uh, from the Portland metro region. Uh, my name is Mira Wonderwheel, and I'm Oregon Tech's annual giving manager. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce Chris, Chris Frazier. Uh, Chris is a 2008 Oregon Tech alumna. Uh, she earned her bachelor's degree in communications with a minor in psychology. While on campus, Chris was a two-time ASOAT president, K-Tech DJ, as well as being involved in several clubs. And after graduation, she actually worked on campus in student activities for five years before moving to Spokane, Washington with her husband, Seth who is also an OWL, an Oregon Tech grad. Um, they live there with their daughter, Sydney, and she now serves on the Alumni Advisory Board. So we'd love to work with her in that capacity as well. And I'm going to pass the virtual microphone to Chris. Here you go. Thanks, Mira. I am really excited to be with everyone tonight. This is my very first time doing something like this over Zoom. I mean, I've obviously had Zoom calls, but this interview type thing is really exciting for me. It's totally a new experience. So I apologize if I'm a little, <laughs> I'm a little rusty on my uh, internet etiquette. I think um, you'll do great. <laughs> Uh, so I am really excited to talk to the current ACOT president of both the Klamath Falls and Portland Metro campus. Um, we have, uh, first I'll introduce you to Mason. He's from the Klamath Falls campus. Uh, Mason is a dual software and embedded systems engineering major who is currently in his junior year. He has been involved in ASOIT for two years now and currently has the privilege of being the president. Uh, additionally, he's also active, an active member of the fraternity on campus Phi Delta Theta. And off campus, he really enjoys the outdoors um, activities that Klamath has to offer, especially hiking and snowshoeing. I love those things too about Klamath Falls. <laughs> um, and then we have Peter Montuck from the Portland Metro campus. Peter is majoring in health informatics and will be graduating this summer. He loves cooking and um, also love learning to lead, especially during these trying times. So let's get started with Peter and Mason. Um, before we start talking with them though, I just wanna get a sense of who has joined us here tonight. So um, if you can just take a quick minute on your screen, you should see a poll um, indicating, uh, you can indicate your relationship with Oregon Tech. Um, so we'll give you guys a minute to see who all is here with us since I can't see all of your beautiful faces. <laughs> I know we usually have lots of alumni, parents, students, faculty and staff, community members. So we'll see who all we have here. I think we're done now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for it. <laughs> um, so it looks like we have the results. It looks like we have quite a few alumni tonight. So hi, guys. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, and then also quite a bit of faculty and staff as well. So thanks for supporting us here tonight and joining us as we talk to our awesome student leaders. So we'll start with um, just getting to know Peter and Mason a little bit better. Mason, let's start with you. Um, why did you choose to attend Oregon Tech at the Klamath Falls campus? So it's an interesting story. It starts with me actually at the Wilsonville campus as a high school transition student. Uh, one of my, I went to Health and Science High School in Beaverton, Oregon, and my, essentially my senior year, I had taken enough classes that I essentially had half of a schedule. 
And so they suggested that I go do the high school transition program. And for those who do not know what that is, it's essentially a place where uh, high school students can t attend Oregon Tech classes for $25 a credit. So it's a steal. Um, and the turnaround is, is a majority of the students that end up in that program end up actually attending Oregon Tech. Uh, in addition, my high school had a lot of uh, joint credit hours with Oregon Tech already. So I'd already taken some of their, the formatted classes in that sense. And then after attending the Wilsonville classes and then graduating high school, I then was really looking for more of a traditional uh, student experience. And so I wanted to live, uh, I wanted to live on, or live on campus for a little while. I also wanted to kind of experience the a small college town kind of feel. Uh, so that's what drove me towards the Klamath Falls campus. And then in addition to just Oregon Tech's amazing, the, uh, I really enjoy the computer science and Oregon Tech, frankly, is one of the only places in Oregon or even on this coast that really has a high quality of education for computer uh, software engineering specifically, but also it's one of the only places that has an embedded systems engineering degree. So then that's really what drove me here. Very cool. I also did credits at Oregon Tech before I started. So yeah. good job. <laughs> it's a good, it's a great way to transition into college. For sure. For sure. Um, Peter, can you tell us um, how did you find out about Oregon Tech and specifically about the Port Portland Metro campus? Yeah, so I found out about Oregon Tech um, through, uh, I was actually going to Mount Hood Community College, um, and I was in their cybersecurity program over there that they had just booted up, and uh, Chris Rosenberg, who isn't here anymore, came and spoke to us on <coughs> campus about Oregon Tech, and I had been looking uh, for the, the next steps uh, for me, for where I was going to go with uh, my degree. Um, and so I finished my associates there and uh, I found my way towards the Portland Metro campus. Um, I, I've i never really been big on uh, being on campus or, you know, having, it's not that connection, but, you know, being in a dorm, that never really appealed to me. So um, the Oregon Tech campus uh, in Portland Metro, it was amazing because most schools, uh, they have a campus like that, but there's no school that has a, a commuter campus like the Portland Metro campus. I'll say that now. I looked at many schools um, and I just loved the whole feel of the Portland Metro campus. And yeah, so it, it just started at Mount Hood and led me to the Portland Metro campus, so. That's really cool that like in, in both instances, Oregon Tech was able to offer the experience that you both were looking for. Like for Mason, it was really important that he had that on-campus experience. And for you, that was less important. And so you were both able to find what you were looking for in Oregon Tech. So that's, I think that's pretty awesome. Uh, all right, so Mason and Peter, I know that you guys were both involved in ASOIT prior to this pandemic. Um, how have things changed on campus as far as like student life and clubs are concerned? Um, Mason, we'll start with you. Uh, there's been a lot of push towards virtual events. Uh, for those who do not know, typically we have ASOIT hosts a ton of general meetings or the uh, Parliament of Owls. And essentially what it is, is just a meeting where all of the student leaders for all the RSOs get together and we talk about things that are going on on campus. For instance, we'll promote things like our next upcoming open tuition form and things like that. Uh, all of those large meetings have to be moved to virtual. And so there's been a lot of, there's been a learning curve with, with moving to those virtual events. But honestly, I think it's become more successful. I feel like we have more student attendees at, at the virtual events than we ever did in person. And it's really been helpful for us to, to have everyone be a little more digitally aware as well as the convenience of, if we have a, even at post COVID, when we have a general meeting, it might make sense to have meetings, have a virtual option for those who just want to attend from home. Uh, we've also seen a lot of clubs do creative and interesting things. Uh, a lot of students have started to move towards one, they have to practice social distancing in all their events. And they've also had to do a lot of uh, outside activities. Like you can see here, uh, top was hosting a essentially just meet and greet outside, uh, socially distanced and they had Jenga and things like that. Um, uh, as well as all of the, um, uh, community service that's continued to happen. Uh, we've seen a lot of 
clubs and services move towards more community service and less social events, which is I've seen has been a really good increase. And we've also seen a lot of just breaking down to the basics of getting to meet each other over Zoom and things like that. Makes sense for a tech school, right? Yeah. <laughs> you think we'd be really good at that? <laughs> uh, Peter, what about you guys on the, on the Met Portland Metro campus? Yeah, it's uh, for the Portland Metro campus, it's actually been, uh, it hasn't been the easiest transition. Um, we struggle with getting students to interact through Zoom. Um, and part of that is because since it's a commuter campus, the the club meetings, the the general meetings that ASYT would do with the, the students in the clubs, all of that was kind of their one connection to campus other than their courses. Um, so a lot of times um, it's hard to get the students to want to do the virtual events because uh, on Portland Metro's campus, we're all still completely remote for the most part, other than I believe there's labs that are going on and there's the few odds and end classes that um, are going on, I do believe. But uh, it's been a struggle since COVID started because most of our stuff before was for in-person, working with the students, connecting them to the campus and you know letting them know that people are there to talk with them and um, so yeah, it's, it's just, it's been really difficult, but, um, and as you saw in the pictures, so the, sorry, uh, the one on the left was the rapid prototyping lab, um, which is getting up and running again. Uh, and they're starting to be able to help students. So that's been one project. Um, yeah. Um, and so that's been one project. Uh, the clubs that run that just got new leadership uh, and so that's been something we've been looking for. And then on the right, I do believe the photo on the right was uh, one of the instructors who is holding a lab during fall term uh, got all of his students uh, boxed meals uh, for being willing to come out and coming into class because it was a class that couldn't be done uh, effectively remotely. So um, it, it's been it's been difficult for us, but yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, if students are primarily already online, the last thing they want to do is get online for another thing, right? Yeah. It totally makes sense. That's cool about the instructor that got them lunch, though. That's awesome. That's one of the things I loved about Oregon Tech. Like, that's not uncharacteristic, right? Like, that's just what an Oregon Tech professor would do. Like, that's just yeah. how they are, you know? Oh, yeah. No, it, it's always like that. There's always something going on. Even during COVID, there's something going on to try and help students and work with students but it's just been it's been hard because it's been a lot less than it used to be um because it used to be that you'd walk in there's always something going on we would have game tournaments or something and you could always find something to do if you had like an hour before class and you just wanted to you know talk with people even if you didn't know them which is the one unique part about uh the portland metro campus no matter what you do you can meet somebody new and everybody's more than willing to meet somebody new. Uh, you can just walk up, say, Hey, and start playing games with somebody. Or if you're in the same class, but you don't know each other, walk up and just start talking about homework. Um, and it's, it's one of the things that drew me towards the Portland Metro campus. So. Yeah. And unfortunately all of those things are exactly what COVID killed, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's totally a challenge. I can see that. Uh, Mason. Can you tell us some of the things, um, some of the safe ways that students are still able to socialize on the Klamath Falls campus? I mean, since it's residential, obviously students have been on campus, they're gonna be around each other. Like, how are they kind of navigating all of that and still able to get their social interaction time? Uh, conversations can still be held from six feet away. Um, this is kind of what we've been learning. Uh, a lot of the library has been really busy still, students studying, students interacting there. Uh, the just in this last week, we ended up hosting the first ever Hootie's Winter Wonderland, which was essentially a social media event with uh, a lot of the student programs, including ASOIT, Treehouse, uh, RHA, or the Resident Housing uh, Association, and then also the Campus Activities uh, Board. And essentially what we did is we got together and we just hosted an Instagram week and had a lot of giveaways, a lot of social interaction there. And we asoit through a bingo. Um, campus activities uh, board they had a drawing contest so they asked for hootie skiing and then did a competition to for some group 
big prizes like Nintendo Switches or 42 inch uh, TVs. And it was really cool to see students interact virtually via social media, but then also we gave away gift boxes and ended up having around 500 students uh, individually come over in front of the student involvement belonging office and pick up their boxes. And there was, it, it's, again, it's just finding creative ways for students to continue to, to interact on campus and, and safely and is obviously the, the most important aspect there, but students have found, have found ways. That's huge. Yeah. I, for me, like when, when I was in ASYT, getting 500 students to do anything <laughs> was a struggle. So that's really cool. <laughs> that sounds like a super awesome event. Um, Peter, so being, being a uh, commuter campus, obviously socialization on campus looks a little bit different. And you kind of alluded to that with your last answer. But um, what does that look like now on the Port Portland Metro campus? Like, how are you guys still able to um, kind of socialize and know each other, even though you're not together? <laughs> yeah, so the answer to that is, uh, again, hard. Um, a lot of our events have got have gone to remote. Um, and we've just, uh, we started a little bit last term, but we've really just started opening the building for uh, student use, um, really this term. So uh, some of the things that we've been trying to do, um, uh, we haven't had much success, but we've tried things like uh, a game night. So um, having people come and trying to do um, some sort of a game. I think uh, one of them that we were going to do that we didn't actually end up doing was we were, we were thinking of doing like an Among Us type thing where we would get um, eight different accounts and then just start having random students play with us. Um, but it ended up not working out. So um, the big thing has been um, trying to, um, now that the campus is starting to open again, we're starting to reach out to students more. And especially now with what's been going on in uh, Portland, uh, I was, I know I was working, I work at the front desk too. I was working yesterday. I would say we had about double the amount of students that we've had since the beginning of this term yesterday due to power outages and that sort of thing. So um, we're starting now to uh, reopen those communication lines. And like Mason said, you know, even if you're six feet apart, right, you can still have a conversation. Um, and so we've been working with the clubs um, which this has really impacted the most because all of their stuff was in campus. So we're starting to focus more on uh, working with the clubs virtually to set them up uh, for next year to be able to reconnect all of those missing pieces that kind of went away, you know. Um, and so I, I guess the answer is it's just been it's been difficult uh, because, like you said, we're already a commuter campus. A lot of our stuff is online and nobody wants to do another online event. So um, We've been talking with students like uh, through Teams, which we've started using more often. Uh, we've been working with the clubs. One event that uh, we did get going, uh, our cybersecurity club did a, um, a red team, blue team um, scenario where one team was trying, they set up two servers and they, were, they did a event around one team trying to break into another team's server so that they could teach people about um, computer security and network security and that sort of thing. And so that was a really cool event um, to be at, so. That sounds super cool. <laughs> um, all right, so a question for both of you. We'll start with Mason's answer first. Um, besides student government, what other activities do you enjoy on campus? Uh, like it was previously mentioned, I'm also involved in the fraternity on campus, uh, Fight All the Data. Um, some, I think some pictures are being pulled up now. We've continued to do some, some big things. Like we, if you see in the bottom right, we have our, uh, we, twice a year we go and clean the highway. And essentially we have a highway cleanup with the entirety of the, the chapter, which in there is around 15 to 16 of us. And there's some great community service hours that revise the community. We also had CASA, uh, the, uh, so case appointed student advocates, 
Uh, what they do is they have a, a section down here in Klamath Falls and they have a Casablanca event every year. And so we end up going and being waiters for that. And that's been postponed till around spring break. And if you look in your top left, you can see uh, this last term, we had five new brothers uh, uh, rushing to join Fight All the Data. And so it was really cool that even in the fall when COVID really started to, to hit, we were able to still become, we were able to still recruit brothers and still able to socialize on campus and get people involved. Um, and so it's been really good. It's been really fun seeing how, seeing a bunch of guys adapt to, to the situation and seeing what we can do and what we can improve on. And really just, again, going back to basics like community service and things like that. Definitely, that's super cool. The fraternity has always done good things in my experience on campus. They've been very involved with everything. <laughs> yeah, we we'll try our best. Peter, what about you? Um, yeah, so I work, uh, I mean, other than ASOIT, I also work at the front desk. Um, and I, I usually talk with almost everybody that comes through. Um, and I really, I enjoy that because, you know, I can talk with faculty, administration, staff um, as they're going through. And I love helping, so I'm also able to help. But um, other than uh, work on campus, I'm also involved with the campus's cybersecurity club. Um, uh, they're just setting up. They just started the beginning of this year. Um, so they're, and that was the club that, uh, that hosted the red team, blue team event. Um, and so they did, uh, they're starting to do more events. Um, and from my understanding, they're also connecting with a cybersecurity club that's starting on Klamath Falls campus, which has been really exciting. Um, and then I'm also, I'm also involved with the, uh, the unofficial Oregon Tech Gamers Club on the Portland Metro campus. There's no official club from my knowledge on our campus, but uh, there's usually around 30 to 40 active members every year. And they're actually, it, it's been really cool for me because I've been able to work with them since I am the ASOIT president. I've been able to work with them and they're actually starting to look at, um, at doing an actual club, going for actual club status and really getting serious about it, which would be really cool. Uh, so it's been, those are two things that I really love on campus, um, cybersecurity and the, the gamers club, so. That's awesome. They, uh, they actually had a gamers club when I was on the Clemens Falls campus, so should do it. <laughs> All right, uh, Mason, in one sentence, how would you describe Oregon Tech to a prospective student considering applying to attending school in Klamath Falls? Uh, I would say if you're looking for the best education you're going to achieve in Oregon for the best price point that it can be offered at, and you, you want to be involved in a more traditional student experience and experience what it's like to be in a small college town, I would say that Oregon Tech is your, your best option and, and truly one that it our numbers speak for ourselves and the fact that we have a $60,000 average hiring salary and almost, I think the number is 96% of our students get hired after six months. So that's a, that's a solid return on investment. If you ask me. I'm glad that's being recorded. Cause that's a good, that's good. Uh, marketing sentence right there. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> uh, Peter, same question in one sentence. How would you describe Oregon tech to a prospective student considering to apply considering to attend the Portland Metro campus, what would you say? Uh, I would say uh, for the Portland Metro campus, and I, I would assume that this is, extends to Klamath Falls campus, but um, the students all kind of band together to help each other. It's a, it's a really unique environment. Um, I've been to many different, I've been to different community colleges and different universities overall. Uh, but the only campus that I've seen where people will see you struggling with something and go, oh, I know that and walk up and just like randomly help you. Oregon Tech's been the only place that I've found that. And it's, it's really comforting to know that, you know, we've all got each other's back. And if we're struggling with something, you know, you can help each other. Uh, so. I totally agree. That's something it's a, I've. It's a family. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've definitely been pulled to a couple classrooms. I remember I was 
in Pervine the, in, by walking along, walking alongside one of the computer labs and one of the students was like, hey, you know computers, right? Can you kind of help me with this real quick? And just pulled me in and had me look at his homework. And I was able to actually help him out because it was one of the classes I had taken the previous term. It's just, it's amazing how casual students are when it comes to just uh, collaborating and working together, particularly for academics here. Yeah, it's the culture. I love it. And I actually have a couple questions for you, Chris. Um, yeah, sure. You were ASOD president twice. You were the DJ for the campus radio station. And you also ended up having a chance to speak at uh, commencement. Uh, you worked at student and student affairs and your husband also graduated from Oregon Tech. And now you're both on the, act the you're both active on the alumni advisory board. What is it about Oregon Tech that drives you to always stay so connected? I think part of it is what we, we just talked about, you know, kind of that community family feel. Um, you know, I mean, my years at Oregon Tech, both as a student and then later as um, an employee were some of the best years of my life. Um, I still keep in touch with, you know, professors and friends that I made, people that I served on ASYT with. Um, just like those were lasting um, experiences for me. And so being able to continue, um, not only to remember those experiences, obviously, but then to help uh, help ensure the success of the university so that other students can have that same opportunity, uh, I think is what uh, motivates me to be involved as an alum now. Um, but then it was just, like I said, like you guys said, you know, um, that feel of just helping each other out and, and um, kind of being together, you know, that's, that's kind of what started it. And then, like I said, after I graduated, it was all about, okay, how can I help other students have the same experience? I kind of feel a little bit like, if you guys have seen Pitch Perfect, there's that scene where all of the alums are like outside of the con competition, right? And they're like reliving the glory days. <laughs> like, I kind of feel like one of those guys, you know, like I'm reliving my experiences at Oregon Tech through you guys, obviously, but then also just, you know, my involvement as an alum, um, getting to kind of give back in that way is, is awesome, so. That's really great, but I'm, we are lucky to have you still involved. I can definitely tell you that. Thanks. I, I agree with what Mason said. It's great. And I also find it great that, you know, Oregon Tech, it, it kind of facilitates the ability to stay involved afterwards. Um, and it makes it really easy to want to stay involved for the, for, for, you know, the future students. Um, and regarding that, I also wanted to ask, uh, a question. Um, what is the best piece of advice you have for a student who's about to graduate and is looking for a job um, after college? I would say probably one of the best things you can do is net network early and often. <laughs> um, we've all heard it said, you know, sometimes it's not what you know, it's who you know. Um, and I think that is definitely true. I think a lot of times um, students forget that and they just think, oh, I have to go out and find a job. But half the time, it's somebody that you already know that connects you with somebody that they know, you know. Um, so utilize career, utilize career services, you know, that's what they're there for. Um, help, uh, you know, make those connections through the resources that are already available on campus. And faculty is a huge resource for networking. You know, they know people, they know people in industry and they can, they can, you know, give you recommendations, they can write letters of recommendation, they can connect you with, with people that they know. Um, so definitely a network, network, network. <laughs> also alumni, right? Like, some of us are very successful business owners. I'm not one of them, but there are a few, <laughs> you know, or they work at, you know, big companies, and they have nothing but great things to say about Oregon Tech. So, you know, if you get connected with an alum who works at a place that you're maybe thinking about working, then, you know, you can make the connection there. Um, so definitely network. And then my other piece of, piece of advice would be volunteer. You know, maybe there's, maybe there's a, a place in the community that you're looking to get involved with or, um, you know, a company that you really want to work for. Find a way to volunteer because half the time when somebody sees you doing something out of the goodness of your heart for free and how hard you work at just volunteering, then they'll be like, you know what, that person is worthwhile. I think I'll hire them to do this all the time and pay them for it. <laughs> um, so yeah, sometimes volunteering can be overlooked as a super awesome way to, to get your foot in the door. So. I've definitely seen, I, one of my close friends, um, 
he was a, he's a brother of Federal Theta, and he also was a former ASOIT president as well, uh, Jun Min Yi. He ended up talking to one of the faculty or one of his teachers, and they ended up getting him a job interview. And the job interview didn't hire him, but the hiring manager knew of another place that did, and now he's currently working at Providence. And it's it's amazing to see that at work and in action. Yeah, for sure. I love to hear that story. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Jin Min as well, so that's great to hear. Um, great advice. Uh, this year on our social media, I mean, this month, February, of course, is Valentine's Day. We feature alumni love stories, and I just feel like this um, ASOIT, you know, representation is just like a big love fest for Oregon Tech. I'm <laughs> really enjoying it, and I think it fits perfectly with, Febu with the month of February and all that we're celebrating this month. Um, we do have a question from the audience, so, or from our attendees. And there is time for more questions. So anybody here who is attending as a guest, we invite you to uh, go ahead and post your questions in the Q&A box. Um, so the question that we have is from our friend, Ken Vandehey. He is also uh, currently serves as president on the Alumni Advisory Board. So works with Chris in that fashion. Um, thanks for coming out, Ken. So we'll start this question. Uh, we'll start with Peter and then go to Mason. And then I think Chris could answer as well. So if you were to talk to a high school student that is considering going to college at Oregon Tech, what are the top three uh, things that you would share as an advantage of going to Oregon Tech versus say another um, college or university? I would say the first for me is the class size. Uh, there's not many other universities that offer an ed education quite as good as Oregon Tech, but also an education that doesn't have 100 people in a seminar type class. Um, so that would be my first one. Uh, the class size is something a lot of people don't think about, but I, I dislike large classes very much. Um, the second piece of advice is the community. Or did Peter freeze up there? Um, the second piece for me is the community. Uh, so long as, you know, you, you can go to any school, but if you don't like the community you're at, you're not going to, to succeed as well as you could if you like, uh, if, if you're connected to the community and you, and you like being within that community. And I think Oregon Tech is a community that makes it really easy to, to like the community, right? Um, and third, it also goes with the community, but um, the willingness to help. You don't often find a culture where, like Mason said, random people will walk up and ask you for help. Everybody at Oregon Tech wants to learn more. Everybody's here for the same reason, and that's to do well, to graduate, and you know, to, do, to get a good job, but also they want more knowledge. They want to learn more in the end. And so I think that's the one thing that kind of connects our community together and why we're all willing to help other people and to ask other people for help. And so those would be my three things. I think Mira's having some- Oh, Mason, how about you? Oops. <laughs> Mason, you're muted. Uh, I'd say for high school students who are looking for a tangible technical education, uh, one of the beautiful things about Oregon Tech is it's a very academically focused uh, community, as well as just the environment is very academically focused. Being in Klamath Falls, it's not a huge party town. It's, and there's a lot of things to do, and there's a lot of things that we can do around campus and, and off campus, but it's also really easy for me to focus on my education compared to somewhere like Oregon State. Uh, additionally, talking with friends that, and, or I guess my, my next point would be the hands-on learning and the hands-on education. We have tangible degrees. Um, computer science is a great example of this um, because I'm, a, I'm going for software engineering and a lot of companies want to hire software engineers, but all, a lot of the other universities, particularly in Oregon, only offer computer science degrees. So they have to take a computer scientist and turn them into a software engineer instead of just getting one out the box. And so having those hands-on learning classes where 
a friend of mine that goes to a different school will just learn about a certain data structure while I'm having to actually type lines and encode it, it's, it's a little different. So that hands-on learning is really what I think sets our academics apart. And then our third, uh, I guess my third thing I use to, to convince a high school student to come here is just the, the way Oregon Tech focuses, every, every decision that Oregon Tech makes is entirely focused on providing the best education we can to students. Um, I see constantly in a lot of these meetings, whenever we're talking about tuition, whenever we're talking about any conversation involving students, it's always the bottom line is what can we do to have the maximum and the best education for students? And that's really why your people go to college. And so I think the combination of the focus, the hands-on learning, and then also the learning environment really just provides, uh, provides what makes Oregon Tech such an amazing school. And Chris, I'll let you answer too. Um. <laughs> well, it's hard. I feel like there's nothing left to say. <laughs> you guys said it exactly. I mean, all, all of the things that you said. Um, I think another thing too is like, you know, a lot of times on the, on the bigger campuses, um, if you need help from an instructor, let's say, you are struggling in a class or something, you go to office hours, you're going to see a TA. You're not going to talk to the actual professor who's the person that was in the class that said the thing that you were confused about, right? Um, but at Oregon Tech, you can go talk to your professor and they want to talk to you and they want to help you. It's not just, oh, take a number, you know, or I'll get back to you later or whatever. And before you know it, you're drowning in, you know, whatever class it is. Um, the instructors are there and they're willing to help and it's not just some random TA assistant person. You'll talk to the person that's from class and that's, you don't find that everywhere. <laughs> Very true. Well, I see Mira is back with us, so I don't need to stay on, but I did want to say um, a hello and a, a shout out to another former ASOIT president who is on the call with us tonight. And that is Jim Blair calling in from Colorado. And he was the president back in 1968 and 1969. And he is still involved as an alumnus as part of the Oregon Tech Foundation. So thanks for being here tonight, Jim. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Mira. Thank you, Becky. Well, everything that you all responded to definitely um, resonates it's what i hear from students as well you know and just the fact that students faculty know your name faculty you know say hello to you by name and that's so i mean by your name and that's so meaningful to people when you're in you know a, a new place and in the university and so um thank you so much for sharing your response and ken says thank you all for your leadership all three of you are excellent role models for for future Oregon Tech students and future ASOIT presidents. So um, for Peter and Mason specifically, what do you hope to be doing five years from now? Uh, I'd go ahead and go first. Um, five years from now, I, so, I want to, at some point, be able to do remote software slash embedded systems and essentially try and travel the world. Uh, I think it'd be really cool, particularly with the longevity and the ease of access for remote educator, for not education, but remote jobs and for software engineering or just anything technical around computers. And I think it'd be really cool to be able to live in a different country every other six months and just kind of travel the world and experience as much as I can while working full time. Very cool. I like it. Um, any particular part of the world that you're drawn to at this point? Um, I've been threatening with a couple of friends of mine, uh, Portugal, because if we live there for three years, then we can get EU passports, which allows us to work anywhere in the EU. And then from there, we can just go wherever. Okay, that's exciting. All right, Peter, what about you? Yeah, for me, geographically, I don't really have a place that I'm tied down to. If I could, I'd like to stay in Oregon. Um, but that's just because, you know, it's where I was raised and where I was born. But I'm willing to go anywhere. Uh, Work-wise, I would actually 
So I'm in health informatics, but a lot of my degree has actually been in database design and development. Uh, so my whole senior project was based around making three, three separate databases, uh, one of them for a company and then two of them as kind of test cases for, for other things that I had wanted to do with a database. Um, so if I could, I'd like to be working um, with database design um, and development within hospitals themselves. Um, and if not working with the database, uh, I would like to be working in hospitals at the very least. Because um, the one thing I've always wanted to do with my degree was to, to help people. Um, and with health informatics, you're, I'm in a great place to be able to help people. So it's just, yeah. So in five years, I'd like to be at least working in a hospital, if not helping with the database design and implementation for hospital systems. Fantastic. Well, I have no doubt that that is exactly where you will be in five years. <laughs> Just a little plug for the networking. <laughs> there is an alum on the advisory board, Erica Hubbard, who did exactly that. So you should uh, connect with her. She can help you. All right. We'll definitely see what we can do to connect Peter with uh, Erica. And I have another question here from John O'Connor. Um, if someone who was getting ready to graduate, what three resources would you recommend to find internships or um, yeah, internships in your future career field? I don't know, if, do either of you have a response to that question? Uh, I have one, uh, MECOP is a great program. I, I was selected for MECOP is here for Daimler Trucks. Uh, I have a lot of my close friends who've gone into MECOP, they, it, they've they really enjoyed it and they've gone to, I'm trying to think, I have a couple of friends who ended up getting into Intel and things like that. Um, it's a great spot for, to get internships and then to also do other things. We also just have talking with teachers. If for, if you're an outstanding student in certain classes, teachers will make they will put themselves out there to then give you a spot to learn. We had a, a, a student here for computer science that was just absolutely phenomenal. And one of the teachers ended up giving a, a personal recommendation letter to one of his friends that had a friend that worked for NASA and she ended up getting an internship for computer science and NASA and things like that. So then if you are, if, so really just the networking and it's a lot of times it's not, uh, what you know, but who you know, but it's also just making sure that you you put yourself out there. Can you say a little bit more about what MECOP is for those that may not know? Uh, MECOP is a internship program. Uh, typically, it's 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 got a lot of different fields. So anywhere from business management to uh, pretty much all of the engineering fields, including I think geomatics and things like that. Uh, and it's essentially a, a program where companies sign up and then you send for MECOP and after a few interviews, they then put you in front of a, a large group of companies that then uh, get to get to basically put bids in for you. And so it's it's really good experience for specifically getting internships that pay at a minimum $20 an hour and for a student, that's amazing. Um, and then also just an internship that's specific to your field, for instance, uh, MECOP really tr tries to pride themselves and make sure that a student in an engineering field, I'm not just going to be going and installing windows onto computers for six months. I'll actually be doing something involved, to be doing something involved with computer science. And so that's really beneficial for, for getting some, some in-house in learning. And which is really what Oregon Tech is all about as a polytechnic to have that real world experience before you graduate. Great explanation of MECOP, Mason. Any other thoughts on that question from Chris or Peter? Yeah, I can, I would say um, one, career services is great. Uh, they've helped me enormously with my application. Um, many, many edits later, it took me about six months to get it down, but um, so career services is a great place. Um, and as an extension of career services, Handshake is a really amazing resource because you know with those internships that they're still being offered. So it's not, it was posted two weeks ago, but is it still being offered? 
all of them have been offered and they're still up there for applications. So as long as they're there, there's a chance of getting that internship. So, yeah. Fantastic. So um, we have some kudos here from your, um, from our alum, ASOIT president, Jim Blair, currently serves on the Oregon Tech Foundation Board of Directors. Um, well done, great presentation by three great young leaders. <laughs> And then a piece of advice from our friend Jim, use your leadership skills, which are people oriented to seek employment opportunities in management program and project management and always keep your sights high. So I think with that, it is time for us to transition to our rapid fire questions. I'm gonna be doing the rapid fire questions and each of you will be answering them this evening. So, I'm gonna mix it up here and we'll start with Peter first and then Mason and then Chris. What is or was your favorite class at Oregon Tech so far? Uh, the course series for MIS 275, which sounds weird. It's SQL database design and development. So um, I actually loved it. It was more of a puzzle for me than it was difficult. Uh, there's a lot of weird quirks with SQL, and it was interesting um, working around those, so. And I really enjoy data structures. It is, it, in the software route, it is the kind of make or break point. Uh, typically, it's taken in your sophomore year, and it's a very hard class where you have to completely design a data structure at the end of, or uh, it's introduced in the beginning of the week and you have to have it designed by the end of the week and there's one every week on top of uh, bi-weekly projects and things like that. So it's a very demanding course and it's, it's, it's one of the courses that they really, that, that separates uh, and it's, it's, I really enjoyed it because I learned so many tangible skills and just putting me in front of a computer and having to code just really helped. That's a really tough question. <laughs> um, I loved all my classes. Well, not all, but most. <laughs> Some were harder than others. Um, I would say probably two of my favorites that stick out to me. Um, I took a journal. So being a communication major, I took um, a lot of communication classes, obviously. And one of them was journalism. Um, and so that was writing for The Edge, the student newspaper on campus. So that was super fun to like go out and interview people and write a story about it. Um, and so just, and then like seeing my, my article posted in the paper every week, uh, it was really cool to just kind of get a feel for that. And then another favorite class was the Holocaust history class. Um, it filled up really quick. And so I had to wait until I was a senior in order to even take it, which I've always been interested in, in that era of history. And my, my dad was actually in World War, World War II. And so um, I just have always been fascinated by kind of Holocaust history. And so that class was phenomenal. It was amazing. I don't think they even offer it anymore because the teacher that taught it has retired, but it was so good. Wow. Okay. You've got to get those classes that are really popular before they fill up, huh? So here's another question about your studies at Oregon Tech. Uh, who is or was your favorite professor at Oregon Tech? And this time, let's start with uh, Chris and then do um, Mason and then Peter. Again, that's super hard. <laughs> um, I would probably have to say uh, Marilyn Dyrud. She was also my um, academic advisor for the la latter part of my um, Oregon Tech career and then also helped me actually get into grad school. Um, wrote my letter of recommendation and that kind of stuff for my application for grad school. So, um, but she, like I said, she's retired. So, but she was also the Holocaust uh, history teacher. So. I would have to say uh, choosing one favorite professor is hard. Um, I'd have to say Todd Breedlove is one of my favorite professors just because he's always got time for you in his office. Uh, the amount of times I've walked in there and just been like, hey, I have a software question. Can you help me with this? Um, and he also just does an amazing job of just explaining the fundamentals of software design, which isn't, which isn't easy. 
Um, and I'm gonna cheat here and give a second favorite professor, but um, George uh, Drunt, he teaches on the embedded side and he just always has, he's an older professor and he always has a good story. Um, he talks about how he had radiation in the back of his car and he, if, if we knew what we knew back then, he could have sued for a hundred million dollars, but he talks about how He's driving the back of his Prius with some radiation in the back, and whenever the, the gigameter gets a little too high, he stops and, and gets out of the car for a little bit before continuing to drive off. And so always having a, a interesting story from, from back in the day from him was always made classes a little more a little more enjoyable. All right, thanks. And Peter? Yeah, uh, I'm gonna cheat too. Um, uh, I, my two favorite professors, because I really can't differentiate between the two, are Lindy Stewart and Maureen Savigny. Um, Lindy is my academic advisor, um, but she's the academic advisor for many students, and she's also in charge of two of the degree programs on the Portland Metro campus, so she's always really busy, but um, she teaches a lot. She used to teach a lot of the SQL courses. I'm not sure if she still does. Um, and she's she always has time for a question if you email her she'll get back to you as soon as she can um and then maureen i've had her for a few classes she mainly does the economics classes but um she made economics so easy to understand that it it's it's amazing that i was confused before uh is the best way i'll put it but she also doubles as my backup advisor um and so they both kind of advise me but yeah, so those would be my two. That's great. Um, Maureen's a longtime Oregon Tech faculty and started in Klamath Falls, so it's nice to hear from a student of hers. All righty, here's our third uh, rapid fire question. Last book that you read? And we'll start with, um, Let's do, let's start with Mason and then go Peter and Chris. Uh, I would say No Easy Day by, let me pull the author, uh, Mark Owen. Uh, it was a book re recommended by my grandfather. And it was a good book. Uh, for me, I believe it's been a long time since I've had free time to just read a book, uh, probably high school, because I've been working almost full time along with my full time school. But I believe it was actually the Aragon trilogy, um, or I guess it's the Aragon, Aragon cycle or something now. Um, yeah, I, I love high fantasy and dragons and all that sort of stuff. So Uh, my last book was The Nightingale by Kristen Hanna. It's, of course, a World War II book, <laughs> Holocaust. Uh, it was really good. They're actually making a movie. I'm super excited about it. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm surprised that um, you all, uh, Mason and Peter, had had a recent, fairly recent book. I, I remember when I was in college, I was like, I haven't read for pleasure for who knows how long anymore. So. <laughs> Um, maybe though with uh, Netflix these days, what, or what is your favorite movie? It doesn't have to be a recent movie, just all time favorite movie. And we'll start with Mason and then go Peter and Chris. Um, all time favorite movie would have to be Finding Nemo. Um, just watched it as a kid and loved it ever since. Uh, for me, my uh, my all-time favorite movie, it's a movie called Stardust. Um, I really loved it. Like I said, I love high fantasy, and that one was a, com a comedy to boot, so I loved it. <laughs> it's a tough choice for me. I would say probably any Sandra Bullock movie is on the top of my list, but I think lately my favorite has been Austin Land. I cannot watch that movie without just dying of laughter every time. Okay, I think I have a movie, a couple movies I need to add to my list because I haven't seen that one or the Stardust one. So always good to have a new uh, movie to check out. 
All right, here's our final rapid fire question. Um, one interesting fact people may not know with, about you. And we will start with Chris and then go Mason and Peter. I'm full of all kinds of fun facts. <laughs> um, I'll share an Oregon Tech relevant one though. Um, on the day of commencement, absolutely, there's, there's the big fountain in the middle of campus, right on the Klamath Falls campus. Um, on the day of commencement, I, right after we were done, myself and two other ASOIT officers ran through the middle of the fountain in full regalia. We were totally drenched, but it was so worth it. <laughs> um, was it a hot day? It was? Okay. An interesting fact. Uh, I, one of my hobbies I really enjoy doing is paragliding. Uh, if you don't know what that is, it's uh, it's essentially where you have a kite above your head and you're magically suspended from the ground with uh, uh, strings and a little bit of cloth. So it's, it's one of my favorite hobbies. So I think you're an adventure seeker. You want to travel the world and you love paragliding. Okay. <laughs> uh, you could say something like that. Peter? Uh, for me, um, I think the one thing that most people probably don't know uh, whenever I go to a new place, I like to collect, uh, if possible, um, I collect like handmade like glass kind of figure figurines or sculptures, mainly sea animals. So like I have uh, a few dolphins, I have uh, jellyfish and that sort of stuff. So. Oh, okay. Collector. Well, we are um, coming to a close for our conversation this evening. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, Mason, and Peter. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from William Butler Yeats, who said, education is not the feeling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And I often think that Oregon Tech is that spark. I, thank you so much for this inspiring conversation. I've truly enjoyed it. And especially thank you uh, for attending our guests, um, for attending this evening's discussion between these three leaders, as Jim Blair pointed out. So I look forward to inviting you all back in the future and see what you do out in the world. And just remember, Chris's great example, once an owl, always an owl. Um, next month, we are looking forward to a conversation between former Associated Student Body President from the Portland Metro Campus, Stefan Valenzuela, as he will interview our Associate Dean of Students at the Portland Metro Campus and Interim Director of Career Services, Dr. Jolyn Dahlweg. Um, so you'll be able to get an insider's look at the Portland Metro Campus and everything that's happening up there. Um, to register for all of these events, you can always go to alumni.oit.edu. And you'll also see that we have a not your traditional virtual happy hour on March 6th for our um, non-traditional students and alumni. So we hope to see you there. I know that's turning out to be a really popular event and we have lots of folks already registered. So we look forward to seeing you next month in March. And as always, for all things Oregon Tech, you can go to oit.edu. And thank you for being Oregon Tech together. Go Owls.